Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. So I recently finished reading the latest installment of Timothy Zahn's new Thrawn trilogy, and it was quite an interesting read. Part of the novel takes place on Thrawn's Imperial-class Star Destroyer, otherwise known as the Chimera. For those of you familiar with Legends, that's also the Chiss's ship in the original Thrawn trilogy, and under Grand Admiral Pelion, the Star Destroyer would go on to serve with distinction during the Yuzang Vong War. Now, in this new novel, Darth Vader joins Thrawn in a voyage to the Unknown Region. He brings along with him the 501st Stormtrooper Legion. During this mission, we immediately see the different command styles between the two powerful figures, and also the dynamic between the Imperial Navy and Stormtrooper Corps. Not surprisingly, these two branches of the Galactic Empire military don't really get along all that well. Today we're going to take a deeper look at the Stormtrooper Corps and also the Imperial Navy, and figure out why they seem to hate each other so much. Contrary to popular belief, Stormtroopers are not the only ground forces the Empire has available. While a lot of the new Disney canon and movies seem to portray the Stormtrooper Legion in that way, the expanded universe in the new Thrawn trilogy paints a more realistic picture of what the Galactic Empire was really like. The Stormtroopers with their heavy armor and heavy weapons were shock troopers, just like the World War I trench storming soldiers they were named after. The majority of the Galactic Empire's ground forces were actually made up of army troopers and naval troopers. Armored troopers were widely used by the Empire across the galaxy to man garrisons and the front lines against insurgents. In the Solo movie, we briefly see the Imperial Army's 224th Imperial Armored Division, also known as Mud Troopers. These type of regular infantry units weren't as well trained as the Stormtrooper Legions, but they were an important part of the overall strategy for the Galactic Empire. The Imperial Army attracted a wide array of Imperial citizens, especially individuals like Han, who had very few prospects. The naval troopers were cut from the same cloth as the army troopers. They were generally considered a joke by the other branches of the military and even the Rebel Alliance. While they didn't see as much combat as the army troopers or the stormtroopers, they were still an integral part of the Galactic Empire military machine. They served as military police, ship security, and gun crews on every vessel in the Imperial Navy, from the Death Star down to the smallest patrol gunboats. And on a lot of ships, especially those that were smaller than an Imperial-class Star Destroyer, the naval troopers served as the main ground team. As a matter of fact, Thrawn's first encounter with the Empire was through a group of naval troopers sent to the surface of a remote planet he was stranded on. It goes without saying that he completely ran circles around them. Now, at the top of this infantry hierarchy were the stormtroopers. They were considered the best ground troops available in the Empire. Officially a part of the Imperial Army, the Stormtrooper Corps had an independent leadership and command structure from the rest of the military. In Legends, it's reported that the Stormtrooper Legion reports directly to the Emperor and his second-in-command, Darth Vader. Stormtroopers were known to be fanatics and extremely loyal to the Empire, so in a way the Stormtroopers were not all that different from the Waffen SS, a fanatic paramilitary organization that was more loyal to Hitler and the Nazi party than they were to sacred Germany. There are two main ways an individual could join the Stormtrooper Academy. One was by serving with distinction in another branch of the military and then being transferred. Another way was to join the Imperial Academy and eventually go on to Stormtrooper School. The Imperial Academies were oftentimes the most prestigious schools on a planet, especially in more sparsely populated areas of the galaxy. There was tons of competition for the Imperial Academies. It was extremely important to join one of these organizations if you wanted to have a good career in the military and get a prestigious posting in somewhere like Coruscant. But most of the time, one had to have political connections or money in order to get into an academy if they really weren't all that gifted. It was especially hard for individuals from a former separatist world to actually make it into an Imperial Academy. Now, for those who didn't make it to the Imperial Academy, there were still regional military schools that they could go to. Generally, individuals who went to these types of schools would become enlisted men in the Navy or the Army or junior officers. Once an Imperial Academy cadet makes it through their first few years of school, they get placed in a secondary academy, which is a little more focused on specific skills. Now their placement is determined by their ability and test scores. 
Those with higher IQs and good reflexes would become officers in the Imperial Navy, while those who tested well in their physical exams and showed more aggressiveness on their psychological profile were sent to the Stormtrooper Academy. And this is where future stormtroopers and naval officers began going their separate ways. For naval officers, flight school and Imperial Navy Academy would be their home for the next few years. There they would learn about military history, tactics, and piloting. They would also become great mechanics and engineers. And these cadets were oftentimes made up of the brightest and most talented individuals in the Empire. And depending on their leadership and piloting skills, they would either become bridge crew or fighter pilots. There was definitely a certain elitist atmosphere about the Imperial Naval officers. It was no secret that the Imperial Navy received the best funding, the best weapons, and technology. Naval officers were also given better quarters, better rations compared to other branches of the military. And of course, every young boy in the Galactic Empire wanted to become a fighter pilot one day when they grew up. Also thinking about our agreement, about me staying on another season. And if these new droids do work out, I want to transmit my application to the Academy this year. Citizens of the Empire had a very romantic view about space combat and serving in the Imperial Navy. Meanwhile, in the Stormtrooper Academy, the cadets there were going through a completely different process. These men and women went through grueling physical exercises each day and became extremely proficient at handling the Empire's wide range of weapons and vehicles. They attended classes that focused on tactics and strategy with a small side of Imperial propaganda. While the Imperial Navy encouraged more free-minded and curious individuals, the Stormtrooper Corps was all about conformity and discipline. By the time that naval officers and stormtroopers had began their service, they had already invested a lot of time in completely different schools of thought. Their elite training separated them from the rank and file, and their different approach to military training made them clash immediately with each other. The naval officers generally saw every other branch of the military beneath them. They saw stormtroopers as simple-minded brutes, a tool to be used to take an enemy ship or suppress local populaces. The stormtroopers, on the other hand, saw the naval officers as elitist pricks who were pampered and safely hidden behind several meters of durasteel during combat. The stormtrooper corps was officially part of the Imperial Army, but they kind of weren't. They also didn't have as much funding as the Imperial Navy. While they were usually very well equipped, they had to depend on other branches of the military for transport and fire support. Whenever stormtroopers were stationed on a naval ship, there was naturally tension between the two services. Oftentimes, the naval commander and the stormtrooper commander would clash. Officially, the higher ranking officer, usually the ship commander, was in charge, but the stormtroopers handed taking orders from the naval officers and sometimes just wasn't practical when stormtroopers were engaged on an enemy ship or land side. Sometimes naval officers and the enlisted men saw stormtroopers as intruders on their ship. As the civil war between the Galactic Empire and Rebel Alliance continued growing, the tactics on both sides became more extreme. Emperor Palpatine eventually dissolved the Senate and then destroyed Alderaan. Now, while the stormtroopers mainly remained very loyal to Emperor Palpatine throughout the war, the Imperial Navy's morale began to suffer. The destruction of the Death Star at Yavin 4 was a huge blow and many of the Navy's finest officers and pilots were lost aboard. Because of the open-minded nature of the Imperial Navy, they began questioning Palpatine's decisions. Some thought investing so much resources into the Death Star was an idiotic move. Others saw the destruction of Alderaan as a cruel and wasteful move that justified the rebellion. Many naval officers and pilots began to quietly desert the Empire. Some would even join the Rebel Alliance. The aspirations of naval officers and stormtroopers were quite different. While stormtroopers were mostly career soldiers and warriors, a lot of naval officers actually had political aspirations. The very nature of their job invited corruption. This was rooted in the fact that senior officers in the Navy were in charge of massive amounts of material, ships, and resources. This also meant that they were responsible with contracting outside companies to help maintain and supply their forces. A smart naval officer could substantially increase their income by receiving kickbacks from contractors that they select. Also, being in control of space lanes and trade traffic meant that they could impose their own taxes and cut deals with smugglers for a certain fate. Corruption was rampant in the Galactic Empire, especially during the later years of the Galactic Civil War. After the Battle of Endor, several Imperial Army and Navy high-ranking officers took their forces and essentially became warlords. The Stormtroopers, for the most part, stayed loyal to the Empire and remained on Jakku to fight in the last great battle of the war. Now, during a conflict, naval officers and Stormtroopers usually dropped their differences and joined forces united against a common foe. Sometimes, the two organizations would even gain mutual respect for one another. 
But at the end of the day, these were two very different military organizations with different training, different mindsets, and also even different allegiances. Perhaps if the Stormtrooper Corps were merged into the Imperial Navy instead of the Army, there would be more cohesion amongst the two groups. Well guys, that's all we have for you guys today. Let me know in the comment section below what you think about this tension between these two military forces. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.